Well, good evening and thank you everyone for joining us. We welcome you to the Orange County Clerk of Courts Legal Matters Forum Series. It's child support and family law, the topic we're talking about tonight. I'm Dane Weister and I'm the Communications Director for the Office of Tiffany Moore Russell, your Orange County Clerk of Courts. We want to thank you for joining us and we hope that you're going to find the information provided to you this evening useful. As a reminder, you will be able to submit any questions that you might have at the end of our webinar through our Q&A function that's on your screen. You should see that at the very bottom where you see Q&A. That's where you can submit questions. We will have a Q&A segment towards the end and then we'll answer your questions and you can also submit those and we'll have a survey for you to fill out at the end of this presentation. Now, this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on our social media channels and on our website. So we are recording right now. So now let me just introduce you to your Orange County Clerk of Courts, Tiffany Moore Russell, who is going to kick us off with a welcome. Good evening, everyone. I am your Orange County Clerk of Court, Tiffany Moore Russell. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming to joining us this evening for our legal forum. I um, mean, it's on a virtual format where we're going to discuss child support matters. Um, you know, it's one of our missions here at the clerk's office to increase access to justice. And one way we do that is to host legal education forums for the public to continue to help them understand and navigate the judicial process. So again, thank you for joining us this evening. We have some phenomenal speakers that are going to share with you and hope that you leave this evening more educated. Um, I want to first thank my staff um, who put this together, made sure that we had a successful virtual format, as well as our speakers who are here with us this evening, Ms. Roberta Walton, the manager of the Self-Help Center, um, two representatives from the Department of Revenue, uh, Mr. David Gillen and Cherie Wright, and then one of our ju judges from the Ninth Judicial Circuit, Judge Diana Tennis. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I, they are phenomenal speakers, and I know they have a lot of information that they will share with you, um, and I hope that you enjoy the forum tonight. So Dane, I'll give it back to you to get the program started. Thank you very much, Clerk Russell. So let's just get right to it. We're gonna jump into the heart of the content we wanna provide you all tonight. And we hope it's going to give you great insight into child support and family law. So to start us off, let me introduce our very own Clerk of Court Self-Help Center and Family Division Manager, Roberta Walton. Roberta? All right. So thank you so much, Dane, and thank you, Clerk Russell. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to come to you tonight and speak to you about a very, very important topic. Um, our families, the nature of our families and the support thereof. Um, I'm going to dive in and attempt to share my screen. Let's see how we can start from the beginning here. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And I'm first and foremost, uh, as Clerk Russell shared, uh, my name is Roberta Walton, and I am the Division Operations Manager for the Family Services Division and the Self-Help Center. Um, I put together just a little overview just to share, when you say family services, um, we've, we're talking about the unit. And so that includes domestic violence injunctions, that include all domestic actions, and it includes child support services. Um, here, here is my team. I have a phenomenal team that supports me each and every day. Um, we have three assistant managers and three operations support coordinators who all um, in their respective ways support teams that are vital to, um, to the work that we do. So let's just talk about the duties in terms of child support. Um, with the clerk of court, the responsibility of the clerk of court when it comes to child support services is dual in nature. Because A, we are we serve as the central depository, um, meaning we have a collaborative relationship with the child um, support enforcement agency to manage and um, to process uh, new child support cases, both non-Title IV-D, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute, and Title IV-D. But in addition to that, we are still the official record keeper uh, for all child support cases. So here I've just broken down just a little bit about exactly what 
the clerk's role is because it's dual in nature and it's collaborative in nature because we work with some phenomenal stakeholders, some of which you're going to hear tonight. Um, everyone who comes into the division um, at the downtown um, courthouse, Orange County Courthouse, always says, you know, I have no idea what this paperwork is telling me. And it's because with the child support, we use a lot of different terminology. Most in most cases, it's in acronyms. Um, CSC, when we say CSC, we're talking about child support enforcement. And that really it means that uh, this is a case that came from Department of Revenue um, and it's being enforced. So we're, we're talking about um, something that falls up under the Title IV D Act of the Social, uh, of Title IV D of the Social Security Act. And so here I have defined CSE for you, the enforcement of child support obligations owed by non-custodial parents to their children, locating parents who may be absent, establishing legal paternity, and obtaining child support and medical support pursuant to that title. Um, SDU is another term we hear all the time, the state disbursement unit. What is that? The unit, what the, what the SDU really is, is a, a centralized unit, one address, one place uh, that handles all disbursement um, of support payments. And so anytime a child support order is, um, is put forth and it's ordered to be paid through the state disbursement unit, that's that one collective unit that all payments can be dispersed out of one area. Um, Department of Revenue, again, that's, our, that's here in the state of Florida, our child support enforcement agency. And depository, I, I actually shared with you before, that's us. That's the Orange County Clerk of Courts Office. We serve as the central depositor uh, for this area. And the clerk system. A lot of people get that mixed up with C-L-E-R-K, but C-L-E-R-C really is the child support case management system um, that handles all of the state case registry data for um, the state of Florida and all 67 counties utilize this one application. Um, the state case registry really is all of the uh, Title IV-D child support cases that flow um, throughout the system. And that's every state um, within this nation and, and, and some international that are a part of a collective, all are part of one state case registry. 4-D case, I keep saying that, and I know you're like, what is she talking about? 40 cases refer to the Title IV-D Social Security Act that was enacted way back in 1975 that really put something in place. It said children have a right to be taken care of. You bring them into this world, you have to take care of them. So the Title IV-D, uh, uh, a Title IV-D case means it is coming through that, that act. And there are some, um, some parameters I'm sure you're gonna hear from uh, David and Sheree a little bit later about. Non-4D, because we, we're not just in sync with DOR, but we also handle cases that are considered non-4D. So uh, you're gonna hear from my judicial partner a little bit later, when cases are put forth and a decision is made that we not have Department of Revenue enforce that case, we call those non-4D. Um, and then you have the income deduction order. We say IDO, you come to my counter and you're gonna um, interface with one of the deputy clerks. They're gonna use these, this terminology, all these acronyms. What's an IDO? It's an income deduction order. And it really is the order uh, that the court has put forth between an employer and um, the SDU in terms of that's where the SDU is now going to send those payments. And it's by functionality of uh, and, and by, um, and they're basically doing it as a, as a result of this IDO. An income deduction order cannot stand alone, however. There must be a final judgment in place for child support in order to have the income deduction order attached to it. Um, next, these um, you see all the time in your paperwork, the obligee, obligor, and the payor. Obligee is really the person um, to whom payments are being made, the receiver, the obligor are the, are the, is the person responsible for making the payments, and the payor can be whoever is on the other side of that income deduction order. And that could be a private moment, or it could be an employer. It could sometimes be the IRS. I hope you don't have to find that out. <laughs> um, 
Um, next, I would just really quickly, the role that we play, again, we're the central depositor. And, um, and I told you, uh, we, we work with uh, 4D and non-4D cases. So that's uh, Department of Revenue and private. And you'll hear that. And here are some of the services that we provide in our office. Um, you come to us, you get your arrearage affidavits, you know, um, you get payment history so you can stay in sync with your case because we do manage that. Um, case audits, payoff statements, all of these administrative services you can get um, taken care of through the central depository. In addition to that, um, payments. Uh, for non 40 cases, we do accept payments, uh, but we also um, manage whether or not you're late. So we issue delinquency notices, um, judgments, and, and, and writs on behalf of the court. And those are by order of the court. Um, again, a lot of people want to know, and I just dealt with this issue earlier today, why do not uh, child support accept checks? They do not. Um, if you come to the child support counter, you need to have cash um, or you need to have a money order or a cashier's check. We do not accept personal checks and we do not accept business checks. Um, here's a little bit about the process uh, of a 4D case. It starts out with a notice of administrative proceeding, but it breaks down and here are just the steps in terms of, you know, there's a statutory period where um, once that notice is sent out, for um, whomever is on the other side, the obligor obligee to respond. Um, and if they don't respond timely, the uh, final order is automatically entered. From the clerk's perspective, we receive a copy of that notice and we um, process that notice. We assign it a depository number and we create an official record for this particular case just based on that notice alone. Um, even before it becomes a final. But once it becomes a final administrative support order, uh, you'll hear from um, Judge Tennis, it really has the credence of a, a judicial order. It's akin to a, ju a judicial order. And here are some of the steps thereafter, um, should you ever seek to change that order that you can walk into. Um, in terms of child support orders, um, and this is very, very important for the clerk's office because again, you hear we manage those within our system, but when we get those orders, and I hope there's some attorneys on the line, we need some very specific information. We need demographics. We need employer information. We need to know who the obligee and the obligor are. All of this information really needs to be um, drafted in the final judgments, uh, the proposed final judgments before uh, you bring them to a judge and ask the judge to sign off on them. Um, we need established terms. We need to know a start date and a finish date for each child. And, we, and when we say terms, um, terms look different for each child. So that's the reason why we also need a step down for each dependent. If one child emancipates um, in 2019 and another one emancipates well, we're in 2020. In 2020, and another emancipates in 2025, we need to see that, and that needs to be placed in the order so that we can make sure that your payments are not um, um, stopped intermittently. And we, we need to know the frequency. We can't just say, he's going to give me $100. How is he going to give it to you? Is he going to give it to you each month? Is he going to give it to you every two weeks? Um, you, you, it's, you need to line it up with how that person is going to pay that money out. If someone says I get paid every two weeks, make sure that's listed in, in the orders. The method of payment, is it going to be paid through the SDU or are you going to uh, do a private pay and, you know, I'm just going to send her a cash app every month and we're going to take care of ourselves. Um, and the last thing, please don't forget the clerk fee. <laughs> we have some statutory fees that we do need you to include in those orders because we want to make sure that they get paid because otherwise your uh, calculations are going to be off. Um, here's a little bit about uh, the way the clerk system, meaning the case maintenance system um, that, are, that are run through all 67 counties for child support services. Yes, it is a blue screen. But we're going to fix that soon, we hope. <laughs> but with that, um, here are, and you see the terms. Here are the terms. 
Here, there's an interest term. Here is a ongoing child support term. And here is an arrears term. Um, and I know that because again, we have these beautiful acronyms, <laughs> right? So each term is laid out collectively. So when we ask for that detailed information, we're asking for it for a reason because we have to put it in the system just as it is stated in the final judgment, not as it's stated in the IDO, as it's stated in the final judgment. Um, here is what's most common in terms of people coming to the clerk's uh, current counter. And this is what an arrearage affidavit looks like. Um, here is the arrear support. This is how much that it remains. But when this order was initially entered on October 27, 2010, it, it stated out how much arrears total. When you got this arrearage affidavit, here is how much still owed. And then here is how much is owed in child support. So that's how you, you read an arrearage affidavit. And here you have all of these beautiful acronyms here that you see me circling around with the cursor. Um, this information lists out all of your payments because this is what your payment history looks like. Um, what we have for you, and all you have to do is come to the clerk's office and ask, but what we have is a matrix that can help you define exactly what those beautiful acronyms look like in that payment history to help you if you um, have an interest. We put this together because we have so many people who come to our counter and ask that question. We wanna make sure that we're providing you quality service to help. Here, when you talk about calculating, keep in mind, and I, and I showed you on that blue screen, there are different terms that you, that you put in and you need to make sure those are spelled out um, in your final judgments. And there are different terms when it comes to arrears as well. Um, there is a difference between an IWO and an IDO. An IWO is a form issued by the Federal Child Support Enforcement Office, and it needs to be attached to the IDO, which is a state form, if your case is a Department of Revenue 4D case. So if it's a 4D case, the IDO and the IDO. IWO, excuse me, and the IDO. If it's not, if it's just a private case, IDO only. Just wanted to show you, this is what the IDO looks like. All right, um, the SDU, um, I put together just a quick breakdown of what the state disbursement unit is. I want to just go off the cuff. I'm not going to read this entirety in its entirety, but I will say a lot of people confuse when you say state disbursement unit, they make that unit either a part of the clerk's office or a part of the Department of Revenue. It is its own entity. It has a separate functionality. And again, as I shared with you, the functionality is a centralized location to send all payments and to automate that. And they not only send payments to back and forth to obligees, but they also send payments to the IRS. If there's unemployment compensation, um, these um, agencies also send money to them as well. Um, here is a little bit, there are three different ways you can make payments. Um, you can pay them online. We do not take Department of Revenue uh, cases. If you have an IDO and the payment says pay it through the SDU, you cannot take a shortcut and bring it to the clerk's office. You cannot take a shortcut and bring it to the clerk's office unless you have a little slip from the judge that says a one-time payment, I need the clerk's office to take it. So you need to either pay it online, uh-oh, went too far, pay it online, you can mail it to the SDU, or you can go to a local Amscot uh, money store and pay. There is a small convenience fee if you do that. But here are the three ways, and here's the the details that you need to list with your payment. Please don't send, and we have a lot of people who do that, a payment and don't list a case number and don't list parties. You need all of that information. Here's the second most thing that we get called upon, and this is to do a case audit. So the clerk's office does case audits for your child support case. If you receive, uh, go to court and, you, and they tell you you owe an amount and you don't agree with it because you say, no, that can't be right. 
you can request a, a, for an audit be done in my office. And we will get, and this is a little bit about what the audit looks like. And it's a breakdown from year to year of the number of payments that was made and how much was actually due. Um, here, this screen came from a IDO. I wanted you to see the breakdown because it gives you the lines. You just sometimes leave them blank. <laughs> but we need frequency and frequency looks different. And if you don't get this part right in terms of the frequency, as it's stated from your final judgment, that's a surefire way to get a delinquency notice sent to you because the calculations are not going to add up and a judgment entered. And if you should get a judgment entered against you, there is additional fees, um, one, a one-time $32.44 fee for certain that is going to be applied, and a judgment that if you don't cure that judgment timely within that 15 days that you're given, um, it's going to be recorded in official records, and, um, and, and it's going to sit there. And, interest is going to toll against that judgment. That interest stays, it does not move. And we have a lot of people who think, I, I paid the judgment, neglected to pay the $32.44, neglected to pay any interest that, uh, that uh, was um, told on that account, and that just continues to increase and sit, and then they, they, they get um, an inheritance or they, they win the lottery and want to know why, why, is the, why are they taking my money? And it's because you have a judgment. Um, so again, the last thing, well, not the last thing, but the third most important thing that people come to our office for is forms. And here um, you can change your address. It is important. We need a signature. You can't just call me over the phone and say, I need, I need you to change my address in the system. We need you to send us an address change form with your signature to change your address in our system. To request to initiate a suspension of um, driver's license. A lot for private cases, we do this. For 4D cases, Department of Revenue handles this part. But if, you're, um, the, if you are owed child support and the person is delinquent and you would like uh, to initiate a driver's license suspension, you can do that through our office for private cases. Um, direct deposit. Um, with all of child support payments, there are a couple of ways to have it. You can have it um, garnished out of your income and sent directly to SDU. But how do you receive it, right? You can receive it by direct deposit or uh, Department of Revenue has these cute little MasterCards or Visa cards. I'm not sure David or Cherie will tell you what they are. Well, you can, it, they will apply that to a card. If you'd like to opt for direct deposit, you can do that through um, my office. And the last thing, again, we talked about is the request for a payoff or a payment history. Payoffs, uh, in large part, is when you get down to the end and you just want to pay it off, you, you can do that and you can request for what's my settlement. I want to settle this uh, for once and for all so I can get beyond. Um, the last thing is just a little bit about, you know, people come in a lot to the clerk's office saying, um, that's my whole check. They can't take my whole check. I want you to know there is a calculation of how child support is calculated federally. And the federal limit is 50% of disposable income. Um, if you are supporting another family, then it's 60% of disposable income. So no, they're not taking your whole check. Um, there is uh, something here um, in, in terms of an equation that's computed. And um, another thing is, if you have a child, my son will be 19, but still in high school. Um, so he's still going to be considered a dependent. So if I were receiving child support, what you would need to do is make sure you note that in that final judgment, if you did not, you neglected to do so, there's still time to come into our office and file a motion and ask the court to extend at least until the child uh, emancipates and is no longer dependent. Here is what that final judgment of support, of course, it don't look just like that. It usually has a lot of writing, but I just wanted you to see that. And, and then modifications, of course, is the last thing. People come into our office to file court paperwork to go back to court and modify an existing support order. 
that is called a modification of your child support order. Um, the standard for that is um, it only happens when it's in the best interest of the child, when the child reaches a uh, majority or emancipates and you're like, listen, the child is emancipated, I wanna modify an existing order, or when there is a substantial change in circumstances um, of the parties. Those are, the, uh, that, that's really when people come in in order to modify their, um, their child support. Here, myorangeclerk.com, I did a snippet from our website. Our website, uh, it, it, it's great. It's to die for, I'm saying that because our director of communications is listening. Um, but I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to see, we have a wealth of information on our website at mylaunchclerk.com. If you go to family services and then scroll down to child support, all of the information here is relevant. Um, it will give you information about payment, where to go, how to change your address, how to request for direct deposit, all of the information I just talked about, how to modify your current child support order. And it talks to you a little bit about our self-help center where we do see uh, individuals who are in need of support um, in terms of their child support case. Um, a quick, um, I love talking about the self-help center because it's my baby, but in the self-help center, as it relates to child support cases, you can certainly come in and receive some triage services from the full-time deputy clerks who work there. And you can schedule an appointment. You can do it at mindwatchclerk.com or come to the Self-Help Center to schedule an appointment to speak to a licensed attorney here in the state of Florida. We partner with the Orange County Bar Association to have those attorneys there uh, between the hours of eight and four, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday appointments right now are virtual, but they will provide you legal assistance for a dollar a minute. They will show you how to represent yourself if you are interested in modifying support or seeking support for the first time on your own without the help of the Department of Revenue. Um, so here is our contact information on how you can reach us. The best way, if you have an, a, a question about your existing child support case, um, the best way to reach us is you can always go online to www.myorangeclerk.com and go onto our online customer service tool and scroll down and go to child support. Child support is one of the tabs that you can go to and just type whatever your question is. Enter your, your name, your case number, and type your question. My deputy clerks um, in, in our office will respond to you. We respond typically same day. Most times 24 hours, no later than 48 hours. Um, or you can come in person down to the Orange County Courthouse, 425 North Orange Avenue. We are located on the third floor in room 315 for child support services. The self-help center is located on the third floor in room 340 if you'd like to come over and receive some additional assistance or schedule an appointment with one of our licensed attorneys. Um, again, Quick to it, the, the attorney appointments have to be scheduled in advance and paid for in advance. And we do not do refunds because of, come on guys, it's a dollar a minute. Um, our hours of operation, 7.30 to four o'clock, Monday through Friday in um, our lobbies if you plan to come in person. And last, we do have a, a, a call center for our child support, um, for our child support office, that call center line you can reach us on there um, at 8407-836-2059 for child support specific questions. So I hope I've got everything in um, and certainly we're gonna take questions at the end, but thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Roberta. So yes, uh, to clarify some things that Roberta was talking about, through our website, if you need to contact us, it actually is called that. It's called our contact us page. So that's what you look for, contact us. And then on that page, you'll see all the different divisions, how you can contact us. And in these days in a virtual environment is the best way to reach uh, the art office, the Orange County Clerk of Courts. And if you wanna know more information about the self-help center, look for that also on our website where you can schedule those appointments directly from there. Okay, so up next now we have David Gillen 
Ann Cherie Wright with the Department of Revenue that's going to share some insight uh, from the Department of Revenue. Take it away, David and Cherie. Thank you, Dane, and uh, thank you, Clerk Russell and Roberta, for um, providing us this opportunity to uh, participate in, um, in Clerk Russell's Legal Matters uh, Child Support Forum. Um, it's, it's more important now than ever that, uh, that anybody that's attending this forum or they get it at a later time has accurate information so that they can make good decisions um, as they go forward in trying to get um, issues resolved with their child support case. And, and uh, there have been a lot of changes that have occurred since March and April. And uh, we know there's lots of questions out there. Um, our office is not physically open. No state office buildings are open to the public. And uh, so we're gonna talk a, a, a little bit um, about how to contact us and get information about your case uh, so that you can understand what the current status is and what um, can be done to take it to the next step, whether it's establishing paternity, establishing a support order, um, or getting collections on a, on a support order. So we're gonna talk about all of that. Um, we are gonna provide contact information. At the end, I'm gonna provide, uh, um, or Dane or Nicole are gonna provide my direct email address. And um, because when we get into the Q&A, you may have some specific case questions that wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to get into details on this particular call on, but we can certainly do that afterwards. Um, and I wanna provide you a direct link to me so that, so that I can help you navigate to wherever you need to get to, to get the information you need so that you can understand what's gonna be happening with your child support case as we move forward. So uh, just that's just a little intro. Uh, Cherie and I are gonna provide a general overview of the child support uh, process from the Department of Revenue standpoint. We do work very, very, very closely with a number of partners and I'm gonna list those in a minute, but the clerk of the court, especially the Orange County clerk of the court um, is an amazing partner to work with. And uh, we are so appreciative of that and not just the clerk, but the judiciary, um, the sheriff's department, Orange County has a really good job of, of having the partners that, that are in, involved with uh, the child support process working closely together and trying to make sure that we're reducing the burden on our customers and making sure that uh, they receive the services that, um, that they're entitled to. So Sheree, if you can go to the next slide, please. These first couple slides are just a couple of introductions. Um, you can, I'm not gonna read all of this, but you saw the vision. I think it's important, uh, Sheree, if you could just go to the mission for a second. The mission of our agency, I think is important. And, and Clerk Russell kind of talked about the vision briefly at the beginning for the clerk's office, but now more than ever, it's important that we achieve our mission. Uh, and it is to serve our customers with respect, concern, and professionalism to make it easier for parents to provide support to their children, which is challenging right now. And then, and then to work with parents, partners in the community to continually improve the child support program. And this forum is one way that we're able to do that um, so that we, uh, we do have those, uh, those chances to share information. So that's what we're committed to doing. So, okay, Sheree. Okay, so families receive child support services through the Department of Revenue's child support program through private attorneys or by filing a pro se action on their own. Uh, we work with many different partners. Um, the following play a big part in us successfully being able to provide child support services to families. Um, the, the child support program is partially funded by the federal government. It's a 6633 match. So um, a good, you know, 66% of the program is funded by, by the federal government. So um, we're in tune to the requirements at the state level and the federal level, and we're always working to make sure that, that we're doing things um, with the most up-to-date laws and statutes and to, to ensure that we're, we're taking the correct actions on our cases. We work uh, closely with the Florida courts. Um, Judge Hennis is going to talk about um, those aspects here in a few minutes uh, with local law enforcement, financial institutions, employers, and, and other state agencies. Now, families can request services by completing an, app, an application. Uh, we do have the ability to complete online applications now. And uh, if you don't go away with anything else, uh, remember floridarevenue.com backslash, backslash child support. If you go to that website, it is a launching pad into every piece of information that you would need to be able to get information or share information about your case. So 
Um, we're going to communicate that that address a couple of different times, but it's floridarevenue.com backslash child support. Um, and you can apply for services there as well. The other way that we get customers is uh, when they're automatically referred to us um, if a parent is receiving some sort of cash or food assistance. Now, the great thing about the child support program is there's no cost um, associated with, um, with our services. Um, so that's, that's a way that we do reduce the burden. Um, there, there could be uh, costs associated with uh, genetic testing and things like that for the parent that would be uh, ordered to pay support. But even that, those costs can be waived um, with the appropriate circumstances. Just a, a quick snapshot of the number of cases that the Department of Revenue is responsible for. It's 1.7 million cases throughout the state of Florida, 1.1 million cases, minor children, which is one of every four in the state of Florida is under, is, is un, su, under some sort of a child support case. We currently have 83% of our families um, with cases that do have a child support order. And that means there's 17%, which is a, a significant number when you look at the total number that, were, that are in process of establishing the child support obligation on. Now for the Orange County area, um, the, the numbers, the, the Orange County office, the child support office services Orange, Osceola, and Seminole. And there's about 75,000 cases just in those three counties. The majority of those would be in Orange County, but that's the Orange County office, the Orlando office, um, is the largest um, office for providing child support services in the, in the entire state of Florida. So uh, there's a lot of going on. And, and, and even if your case is outside of Orange County or Osceola or um, Seminole, we can still provide you assistance no matter where your case is in the state of Florida, as long as it's the Department of Revenue case. Okay, so some of the services that we provide, we work with families and partners to locate parents, employers, and assets, establish paternity, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a minute, establish and modify child support orders. I see that we've already got some questions about that um, that have been submitted. And, and depending on whether it's a private case or a Department of Revenue case uh, is gonna give you some, we, we can give you some guidance on or at least some information on, on what, what um, um, guides the processing of a modification action. Um, receive and distribute child support payments and monitor and take action to help parents comply with their child support orders. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna show this slide twice uh, because this is a real, really important piece of, uh, the information here is really important for you all that, that need to get information about your case. As I mentioned a minute ago, no state office buildings are open right now, so we cannot provide any in-person customer services. And we have, you know, on any given day in the Orlando office, they would have over 300 customers a day walking into that office. So we know there's a demand for information, and we've tried to fill that gap by um, adding additional staffing resources to taking phone calls, um, uh, being able to assist customers through web chat, we have now opened up um, email and we're interacting with our customers by email if they uh, agree to that mode of, of, um, of interaction. And we have e-services available and, and, um, and faxing and some of those other things. So we, we've tried to uh, reduce the, um, the, the, the challenges of getting information and, 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 and getting the follow-up that you need. Um, and we are looking for ways to improve even more. And I'm looking for feedback from you all that, that do have cases and have been trying to reach us on what your experiences have been and whether it comes out right now in this forum or whether you sub send an email to me later, um, we value your feedback and, and where we have opportunities, we're gonna certainly make improvements where we can and, um, and we're gonna be communicating all the way and trying to help you uh, uh, get the information that you need. Okay, the first step in, in a child support case is establishing the support order. We work with families and partners to help children get the support that they need and deserve. A child support order sets the amount of ch uh, the child support that the parent is required to pay. The order can also establish paternity and require health insurance and payment of medical expenses. Support orders can be changed as the circumstances of the parent and the, and the child change. And once again, that's the whole modification area that, that we'll talk more about and, and try to answer some of your questions that, that you may have about that particular process. Orders are established. Oh, sorry. 
That's okay. Orders are established and changed administratively and by going to court. So administratively and judicial. There's two different uh, processes to establish and, and modify. Uh, we end up with the same result, a fully enforceable order, um, but there's two different ways of achieving that, um, uh, that final outcome. Okay, just a quick overview of the establish, uh, administrative establishment process. Um, like I said, orders established through this process have the same force and effect as a, as a judicially established court order. An administrative action starts by serving a notice on the parent who owes or may owe support. Genetic testing is used when paternity needs to be established. Uh, we ask both parents for financial and other information needed to determine the child support amount. Um, and then based on that information, uh, that's provided by the parents and the Florida Child Support Guidelines, we then calculate the amount that is going to be owed and then we put that into a proposed order that we send out um, and, uh, and hopefully get agreement on and then we move forward to finalizing that order. Just a quick note about genetic testing. Up until the pandemic, we would conduct genetic testing in our offices um, through the buckle swab process. Uh, we obviously are not doing that anymore and we have secured a contract with the genetic testing company that's going to be providing us genetic testing uh, services, which is going to allow us now to really start ramping up um, our case processing on all the new cases that have come in and all the cases that were pending um, that had uh, paternity related issues. So we're excited about that. And, um, and if you haven't already and you're in that part of the process, um, you can be on the lookout for information to be coming your way regarding your genetic testing appointments. And then the judicial process. Um, the child support program partners with public and private attorneys and the clerk of court to establish court orders for paternity and child support. A court action begins when the program's attorney files a petition in court and it is served on the parent who owes or may owe child support. Information provided by the parents is used to calculate the amount of the child support to be ordered under the Florida Child Support Guidelines. A hearing is then held and the court issues a support order that includes an order requiring the parent's employer to deduct child support payments automatically from the parent's income. The order provides the parents with instructions um, on how to pay their child support. Similar to the, the uh, you know, Roberta talked a little bit about the income deduction order process. And um, so we go through that process as well. And, and one of the things I just wanna stress regarding uh, the, the trigger for being able to move forward on a child support establishing a child support order is that we have to serve the, the, the customer that is, is been determined as, is the, the father or is the, the, uh, the uh, possible father um, so that we can then take it to the next step. If we don't get service, then we can't move forward or um, there's a potential to go in some other directions, but it's best to cooperate with the process. You wanna be involved with this process. Um, if you have been identified as a father, because if you're not, then you have rights and responsibilities to ensure that, and you want to make, we want to make sure that you, you utilize those so that you're not inappropriately named as a father. And then if you are the father, you definitely want to be voluntarily participating in this program, whether it's administratively or judicially, so that the most accurate information is used to establish the support order and that we can then have an ongoing um, interactive relationship as, as the, the time goes along. So if you do have issues um, with paying, and, and this is a perfect example of what we're going through right now, we've got so many um, paying parents who have been laid off or, or are not working or under earning, and we recognize that and, and we wanna do everything possible to work with you all to, uh, to manage that and to, um, to reduce those burdens on you until we can move into a, a more normal uh, type of processing and work um, environment as we go forward. So paternity establish uh, meant is, a, is obviously a big key to the child support um, process. Um, ch children with unmarried parents need to have paternity established before support can be ordered. Um, establishing paternity obviously identifies the child's legal father. Um, that in itself, um, creates rights and responsibilities for the, the, the father and also the child, you know, as they go through their life. And um, so that, that's a really important step for everybody involved. Uh, Florida allows parents to establish paternity voluntarily at the hospital when child is born or anytime after leaving the hospital by signing a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity. If paternity is not acknowledged, it is established administratively or by going to court. 
we can use genetic testing to determine who is the biological father. And then the final st step in the establishing paternity, uh, when establishing paternity, is updating the child's birth certificate with the, file, with the child's name with the Bureau of Vital Statistics. So it's really important that any parent, especially a father, that is going to be signing a voluntary um, acknowledgement of paternity, that if they're not married, that, they, uh, that they're sure about that because there are ways of being able to verify that through genetic testing if there is any un uncertainty. So I just wanted to, to reinforce that message. Now, order modification, like I said, I've seen multiple questions all on, all, on this already. Uh, we, as a program, uh, are, are prepared to deal with the impacts of, of COVID. It's different than it was in 2008 and 2009 when we had the Great Recession, but it's similar too. We know that back like it was back then and it is now so many of our customers have been negatively impacted in being able to earn income and then pay their child support and uh, we still have not worked out how we're going to manage through that part of it because there's there's things that, that we're not sure about and a lot of the impacts are beyond the control of of the customer and, and we understand that so um, but if a child support order does need to be changed um, because of a permanent change in circumstance, we want to make sure that we're addressing that. And even if it's a temporary change, we want to make sure that we're getting that information and that we're updating our cases appropriately so that um, we don't want any adverse actions to occur on anybody that may be um, being negatively impacted by the current pandemic. So either parent can ask for review of the child support order um, to try and modify their order um, if circumstances have changed. Uh, for us, we do ongoing three-year reviews. Um, if, uh, if there is a, a significant change in circumstance for us to be able to move forward, it would take a change uh, based on the new information that we get, both the financial information for the, uh, the mother and the father. It would have to be 15% or $50. So it doesn't take much to um, warrant uh, us processing a case then for consideration of a modification. Um, so we can also, pro and we can process modifications both administratively and judicially. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the front end of, of the process. Um, just a general overview. What we're going to do now is shift towards what happens after a child support order has been established. And Cherie Wright, who is an administrator with the child support program, um, here in Region 4, which covers East Central Florida, is going to provide an overview of the next part of the presentation. Yes, uh, as Mr. Gillen said, once we actually have a support order, our main goal is to achieve voluntary compliance. Basically, we want the child to begin to receive the monies that it needs. Um, and we have a few tools that we utilize to um, ensure compliance. This is just a listing of all the things that we that we can do. We'll go over them there on each slide. But, you know, it's financial institutions. Um, there are state and federal laws that apply to how and when certain methods can be used. And we also involve other state child support agencies when one parent lives in another state. One of the biggest things that we're doing now and even with COVID now is written agreements. We've always had them, but this is basically when we the program negotiates um, a term of repayment for the parent that is due support, uh, most likely they're receiving some form of enforcement. If they come in or contact us now and talk about what they are able to pay to stop that form of enforcement, we will allow them to go into a written agreement. Now keep in mind written agreements, we're not going to, we don't ever wanna set anyone up for failure. So typically with a written agreement, we're either asking for an increase in payments, whether it's ongoing support, or we're asking for a lump sum of money. Most times it's in, those are conjo conjoined together. But um, it happens, we can do it over the phone now, since we're not allowing people in the office, we just want to set people up for success. Now, one of our, our most popular way to achieve compliance is through wage withholding. You've heard it as income deduction notice, income deduction order, um, income withholding order. These are all the same things. These basically um, are wage withholding notices that we send to an employer to ensure timely and consistent payments. More than half of all child support collections come from wage withholding. 
suspension actions. Most suspension action that most people are familiar with is driver's license suspension. Um, it's our most common enforcement tool and it seems to be the most effective. If a parent does not pay or reach an agreement to pay or contest the action, the parent's license can be suspended or passport cannot be renewed. We can also suspend professional licenses, hunting or fishing licenses. Now also keep in mind, we realize nobody, you know, nobody really wins when we are suspending someone's driver's license. We much, much rather prefer for the parent due support to keep the license so that they can then in turn find a job and make child support payments. Um, but sometimes parents don't always pay. So this is, this is a tool and this is why this is in place. Now, of course, we also have court actions. Um, the outcomes vary on each case, but can include full or partial payment of past due support. And it also includes contempt. This is really our last and our most severe form of enforcement. We typically try to achieve compliance without going this route. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes we do have to go there. Liens, this is um, the child support program can place a lien on vehicles, boats, personal watercrafts, mobile homes, and real estate. This usually doesn't come around until the person who owns that property or that item tries to sell it, uh, meaning they won't be able to sell it until they satisfy that lien that was placed on it from us. Some of our other collection methods are insurance settlements, if a parent owing support is due to receive a settlement, we can intercept it. We will apply it to the past due balance. We have IRS tax refunds. This is basically tax refund intercepts. If someone, if a parent is due a refund, we will intercept it, apply it to the balance. If more money is received than what is owed, the parent will get the, the, the remaining balance. But if someone is delinquent, you know, 5,000, their return is only 3,000. Yes, we would take and apply the whole thing unclaimed property monies, lottery winnings, reemployment assistance, and workers' compensation benefits. We have ways to garnish these forms of payments to ensure compliance. Bank accounts, we can place a freeze on a bank account or another financial institution. Um, we don't typically notify the parties about this until the action has already started. Um, we do also take a parent's current spouse into consideration because I do know that comes up quite a bit. I share this bank account, you know, with my new wife or my new husband, whatever it may be. We will um, take steps to ensure that, you know, your spouse who is not associated with your child support case is not penalized by the bank freeze. But yes, we will freeze a bank account. And credit reporting. Child support reports past due amounts um, are just like a credit card debt. We do report it to credit reporting agencies. Typically, this comes up when someone is trying to buy a new home, a new car, anything that's going to require a credit check. Um, it comes up and obviously they want to satisfy that. So we will work with them to take the steps that, are, that need to get done in order to you know, clean up that credit reporting. And this usually occurs about once a month. Child support does enforce medical support. Um, we take into action, we enroll the children into health insurance or collect the child's medical expenses that are not covered by insurance. We do have certain percentages that parents have to pay for uncovered medical support that will be within their support order. And we also have cost. This is um, what Mr. Gillen mentioned earlier, as far as genetic testing costs, if we end up going to court, there are court costs. They're usually small, but the biggest thing that we that I know I informed every customer that I come in contact with that is worried about costs. This is something that we collect on the back end. If we receive a $400 payment, all of that is going toward the child support. We do not apply any ongoing child support to court costs. Once um, a child emancipates, the case is arrears only, or there's just a past due balance and that has been paid in full, that is when we then apply it to cost. But we certainly would never apply money sent for an underage child to court costs. $1.62 billion in child support were collected in the federal fiscal year of 2018-2019. 98.1% went to families, 1.9% went to reimburse public assistance dollars. $1.1 billion have been collected through income withholding from the parent's paycheck. And this goes back to that IDN, IWO, IDO, basically the 
notice that is sent to a job telling them how much to deduct. And not to mention, just a note, when we do begin to receive payments from an employer, depending once we get enough payments, it can automatically reverse enforcement. So it's not something that you even need to reach out to us about. It can automatically reverse it depending how far into the enforcement action it has gone. For every dollar spent, child support program collects $5.97. Here we would ask for any questions, um, but I believe we're gonna cover those at the end. And this is what was mentioned earlier, numerous ways to get in contact with us. Of course, our offices aren't open, so they have our program office, which dictates you know, how Florida Department of Revenue addresses child support. Um, they have developed a lot of new ways for our customers to get in contact with us. Email communications weren't really popular prior to COVID, but now it is in a very, very viable way to communicate with us and talk about your case. We've had web chat for a while. Our call center is still open. We still receive um, information and documents via fax and mail. And this is just some of our information, but I'm pretty sure, I believe we're gonna come back to this at the end of the presentation. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you very much, Cherie Wright and David Gillen from the Department of Revenue for that great information. And um, we're going to be moving on with more uh, information for you related to this. And uh, first thing I just want to tell you is, yes, at the end here, we're going to take your questions. If you have a question, submit that to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, please. We've seen some people raising their hands. So if you have a question, uh, submit it through the Q&A portion there, and then we'll be able to answer it from there. So up next, special treat now, uh, we're going to get some information from the courtroom. And we have Honorable Judge Diana Tennis joining us. Thank you, Judge Tennis. Thank you, Dana. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I first want to say for all of you folks out there who are uh, pro se litigants right now, folks handling your court case on your own or that you might be a pro se litigant in the future. I think it's a very, very smart if you take advantage of this amazing opportunity that the clerk's office is giving. Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions of the people who are really in the thick of it. They know the answers. So I would um, encourage you to use the Q&A. When we do these presentations live, it's a little bit easier because we have the give and take keep in mind that the question that you're putting in the Q&A is the only thing we're going to know. And, you know, sometimes if they're confusing, our answers aren't going to be as good as you would like them to be. So put a little thought into your question. But um, for sure, ask questions. That's the only way that you're going to get the information you want. So I'm a family law judge. I have uh, this is my sixth year. I'm super excited about it. I love my job. And um, I want to help you be the best pro se litigant you can be. And my first biggest piece of advice would be to tell you to put care into your case. Um, if you were going to apply for a loan for a car or your house or apply for a job, you would be very careful about the paperwork because it would be important to you. And everything that you do in the court is probably going to be about things that you like to have, meaning your, your possessions, it's going to be about money, and most importantly, it's going to be about your kids. So put time and care into the documents that you file because you will get a much better return on your investment. So um, read the forms carefully that you're gonna fill out. Um, as Roberta was talking about, you can go to the self-help center and get some amazing assistance and forms and help. Be, um, take your time, um, read those forms and make sure that you're filling out all the information that's needed. We are really, really busy, and whether that's the Department of Revenue and the Child Support Hearing Officers dealing just with that type of child support, or whether it's the circuit judges dealing with other types of child support, family cases, custody, property, we are extremely busy. And with COVID, we are even crazier busier. So you just have to make it easy for us to want to figure it out to help you, because we really do want to find solutions for you, um, but we, we, it's easier when it's a little bit um, uh, more, more carefully thought out. So read those forms carefully. Um, pay attention to the motions that get filed that say you're doing something wrong. 
um, pay attention to that, particularly when those are filed by another lawyer. Uh, those are folks that they're not always right. They don't always have the right information, but they are officers of the court and they know the rules better than you do. So if you get a motion that says um, that party didn't give me the discovery, they didn't file their financial affidavit, anything like that, pay close attention to that. Because by the time you get to a hearing, it may be a situation where the judge is going to be forced to make you pay their attorney's fees. So don't let that happen. There are rules. Google them. They're out there. The self-help center, pay attention. Read the forms. They're going to tell you what you need. And sometimes read the motion that says you're doing something wrong and figure it out and you may need to be doing some other things. Um, at trial, and this is particularly true, true of hearings now in the era of COVID. So we are doing all family cases pretty much exactly like we're doing this today, uh, virtually. And what that means is anything that you want the judge to look at evidence-wise to, to consider in making a decision, you're going to need to get to that judge ahead of time. And that will always mean sending a copy to the other party. And usually that's going to mean uh, doing it by email, unless you have a conversation with the judge about doing it some other way. You have a, at a pretrial hearing, maybe you can say, judge, I don't have access to email, but I will drop it off or something. Um, but those are, those are important things that are different now. You can't just bring in your phone and hold it up and have the judge look at it when we're doing things virtually. And you can't just bring your paperwork to the hearing. You actually have to provide it ahead of time. And so that's definitely more trouble for you. But to know that you need to do that is going to get you a better, um, a better, uh, a better result. Um, and, and read the orders. Read every word. Most of my orders are at least three pages. Some of them are 30 pages. But I don't do it just for the fun of it. I do it because I want people to understand every single thing I expect them to do. So make sure you read the orders, keep them around, and make sure that you're following them. Um, financial affidavits and mandatory disclosure. If you want child support in, when, and the Department of Revenue is not involved, you must follow the rules related to financial disclosure or we won't have enough information to give you child support. So make sure that you file a financial affidavit that is legible, that is well thought out, that makes sense, that has everything in it that's correct. And then if the other side has not filed their financial affidavit or hasn't provided you with a tax return or pay stub, file a motion that says, judge, I want tax return and pay stub. Um, because that's information that we'll have to have in order to get um, child support if, if the department is not involved in doing those things for you. Um, make sure that your motions are readable. I, I've got to be able to read them. I just, just today, I was so aggravated because I had something in the scroll that I just couldn't read. Not, if, I mean, my penmanship's horrible, but you've got to figure it out. Take your time, make sure it's legible, put details in, but also make it short. And I know that sounds kind of contradictory, but what we don't want is you going on and on and on about things that happened 18 years ago. What we want is details about what you think went wrong and what it is you want. What do you want? What is it? We, the, the word we use is remedy. What's the remedy that you're asking for? Um, and don't make it super lengthy because we don't have time to, to, to read for four days. Um, evidence. So again, you're not going to be able to show us what's on your cell phone. Whatever you want to show us, you're going to have to print out. You're going to have to um, figure out how to scan and send through the email to the other party or to it and to the court, um, or you're going to have to deliver copies to the court and to the other party. So make sure that you know what those rules are when you're talking to the judge about what the hearing is going to be. Make sure that you use only the important stuff. Don't file a thousand pages or a hundred pages or 80 pages of talking parents communication or text messages. Just file 10 or 12 pages to give us a flavor for what the problem is. We don't, we, we don't have time to be reading that much, but we just need a flavor of what the problems are. Understand that you're gonna, there's going to be rules that you're not going to know about. We, we get that, and we are compassionate about it, but our rules tell us we have to treat you the same. Sometimes we're going to try to treat you the same while educating you on what the rules are, but you really need to do some make some effort to figure that out. Again, the self-help center is a great place to go to try to get some of that stuff for you. All right, here's your lesson on hearsay. 
And I'm only saying this to save you some grief. This is your, your two minute law, law school. Hearsay is something that I can't consider most of the time in a trial. Particularly if you are going up against somebody who has a lawyer, this is gonna be a huge problem. Typically, I can't look at police reports. I can't look at DCF records. Uh, I, can't, I can't let you repeat to me what your children told you. Those are all considered hearsay. I'm not gonna make it more complicated than that. I'm just trying to make a point that there's gonna be stuff that you're gonna want the judge to hear that there's a lot of rules and sometimes they're not gonna be able to hear that and that could be frustrating to you. Um, if, there, if the other side doesn't object, then the judge might look at it anyway, but, but just understand there's a lot of rules out there. Um, COVID, you're gonna to have to be patient. We are, I think all of the divisions are a bit backed up. I know that, that um, child support must be backed up because they have so many things that had to be put in place before they could start doing hearings again after we were got kicked out of the courthouse. And so need to be patient. Practice the technology. I'm using Zoom, some other uh, uh, judges are using Teams. It all works kind of the same way, but go on ahead of time and practice it. Make sure you know how to turn your audio on when you're in a virtual hearing. Practice with your friends or your family or um, your coworkers or, or somebody, um, definitely practice. Don't argue with each other during the hearing. It's so easy to talk over each other when we're all kind of looking at the little boxes, but it makes things very confusing. So try not to argue with each other. Wait your turn. Um, the judge will get to you. We, we always like to hear from everybody. And sometimes it just has to be one at a time. Um, don't file a motion over every single little thing. We just don't have time for it. And if you've got that file that there's like motion after motion after motion after motion after motion, at some point, you all are going to just seem like a problem to us. And like we can't do really do much because you're just going to continue to be a problem. And you don't want to you don't want to have the judge not want to help you. So keep in mind what that looks like from those of us who are, who are trying to do our jobs really hard every day, hearing after hearing after hearing. Um, try to pick and choose your battles is what is I think what I would say. Um, you are in a courtroom. You are in a courtroom when you are in a Zoom hearing. I want you in clothing, shirts included. I don't care about the pants so much, but you definitely be wearing a shirt. Don't be in bed. Don't be chopping gum. Don't be driving down the highway. Um, it's, uh, don't have people around you whispering in your ear so that I can hear them giving you answers. Don't do any of those things. Wear something decent. Have a decent light coming at your face so that you're not backlit and you're just a big shadowy thing. Be, this is your presentation in the courtroom. This is your opportunity to talk to the judge Make sure that you make it count and, um, and treat it seriously because it is serious. Um, always ask questions of the judge whenever you have them and put your questions in the thing today. And I think that's it. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Judge Diana Tennis. Always a treat to have you. Great information. I mean, it's not very often that you can get a perspective like this from the bench. So uh, hopefully all of our participants uh, you're finding this information valuable, valuable. So for this portion of the webinar now, everybody's been waiting for this, right? We're gonna be looking at your questions and trying to get you some answers. It's the Q&A portion of our webinar. Uh, we'll be answering some of your questions that you've sent in. If you still have one, make sure you go right into that Q&A section. And if you have any other questions, you may submit them at this time. As a reminder, you may ask a question using that Q&A function on the screen as I've already stated. So going to jump right into this. It looks like we have about 12 questions as of right now. Um, and so uh, first question is, and then we'll see who is the best on our panel to try and give, give us an answer. So this question is, I have a request for hearing trial for CS modification pending since March. I filed an emergency request for expedited hearing on September 3rd. DORCS is no help and says I just have to wait. How can I get a hearing? I've had a significant reduction in wages. I'm paying for two children instead of one, graduated in May through IDO, 40% of my pay. I'm paying three times what I should be according to the worksheet. Do I need to hire an attorney? So who on the panel wants to take on that one? Well, it sounds like a DOR case. 
Did I understand that correctly? It seems like yes. D O R C S is no help. Says I have to wait. Is according to uh, what? It's, it, it looks like a DOR case, but they're asking for a modification of a DOR case. And um, he's saying he has to wait for a hearing. So. Yeah, there, Judge Tennis just talked about the, uh, the, the, the docket uh, backlogs that are in place in a lot of different areas. And, and we're, we're getting more familiar with the technology. We're getting more cases set. But as far as your specific question, um, the without talking to you and trying to get some more details, it's going to be hard to just provide a general response because the, the way the cases are being docketed, whether it's a, a, a case where we're modifying or establishing a new order or compliance, um, it's a little bit different. Um, so we're going to be providing my direct email. And what I'd like you to do is send me an email and we can engage that way. And I will make sure that that you get the information that you need and that we stay in contact with you going forward. And just so you know, my, my title is regional manager. So I have the, I do have the ability to oversee um, and watch things that are going on, not just in this region, but across the state. So it doesn't matter really where your case is, I can assist you. And I wanna be able to do that because of, of what's going on. And we have this unique opportunity to interact through this forum. Um, so hopefully that will help you. It may not help you with the exact info you need right this second, but as long as you follow up with me, I promise you, you'll get the information that you need. Um, and, and, and that's a promise from me. Okay. Thank you, David. And in fact, we're trying right now to, uh, basically put in your email address, uh, to the, to the attendee so that they can receive it. Okay. I don't know if you want to just provide that? Yes, uh, I can provide it. it. I can provide it to you. It's David, D A V I D, dot Gillen, G I L L E N, at Florida Revenue dot com. There you go. And we just posted it to the attendees. Yeah, so you, you don't see to, that on your screen. Yeah, and if you're submitting something to me, you don't have to put a whole bunch of personal information. Uh, just give me a general overview and then a good contact. I mean, I know you, you are providing me your email, but even with responding back in email, we've got to go through some, because confidentiality is so important and it's something that we have to be assured of before we respond back in any forum. Um, if you can provide a phone number, that would be very helpful as well. And if you have your case number, and then uh, once I have that info, if you just have a phone number, that's enough. And uh, we'll get back with you and we'll get you the, the information that you need. Okay, great. All right, on to our next question. Uh, our next question is, why do some child support DOR cases have a notice filed and then an order is entered, but others have an actual petition filed, proceedings, and then an order? So why do some child support DOR cases have a notice filed and then an order is entered, but others have an actual petition filed, proceedings, and then an order? David, I, I think the gist of that, taken with the, a couple of the other questions, was the distinction between the administrative case and the, um, and the DOR filing a petition in, in court, I think is the gist of that. There was a follow-up question after that asked how the department decides which way to go. And I didn't touch it because I have no idea what your algorithm is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think I did respond just to, from a clerk of course perspective, and I said that that varies <laughs> um, because it really does depend in terms of, it, but from what I have been seen that if there are some unique circumstances in place, the department may seek to uh, move forward judicially by fi filing a petition for child support or petition to establish paternity DOR. And typically what's unique about those scenarios is there is no acknowledgement of paternity um, that has already been signed off on. So there was no signature on the birth certificate you know, or you don't know where that uh, other parent is. You're trying to locate that person in large part, sometimes that is when it goes 
to the petition as opposed to the notice. And the notice really is to effectuate an administrative child support order, which ends up being a final um, administrative child support order, which has the same effect as a judicial. Yeah, and the only other thing that I would add, I, I do want to, full disclosure, Sheree and I are not attorneys, we're administrators, so we don't want to try to answer legal questions, but generally, uh, whether a motion is filed or a petition, it, it's, it's decided by the attorney based on what the legal requirements are. So they're going to follow those rules when determining which is the appropriate action to file. Okay, hopefully that, that helped. Our next question is, um, person who submitted it says she's confused. How is DOR establishing child support? Are they also preparing a parenting plan? David, I think you said you would wanted to try to answer this. Ye yes. So um, just for everybody, a parenting time plan is an agreement between the parents that states the days and times a child will be with each parent. So just in general, I'll give you a general response, but if both parents agree, they can sign a Title IV-D standard parenting time plan or their own plan. The plan may then be included in the final order established by the child support program if submitted before the final order is entered. If the final order has already been entered, either parent may file a petition in circuit court to establish parenting time on their own. So we wouldn't get into the enforcement of the parenting time, but if it meets the, the criteria, we would help facilitate the establishment of a parenting time plan. And I will tell you, uh, there's information about the parenting time plans at um, out on the, the website that I mentioned a minute ago, um, as far as Florida revenue backslash uh, child support. And um, you can basically type in any question that you have and it'll, it'll feed back the answers that are related to um, the services that, that we provide. But that's the overview of what happens with the parenting plan, um, at least on the 4D cases. And I'd okay. like to add to, you know, with the, what David said is very important. They don't enforce it. They are facilitating just to help you if you are in agreement. For those who cannot come to an agreement, they have a right to then come to uh, the courts come to the clerk's office and file to establish um, some type of time sharing plan. Please keep in mind a time sharing plan and parental responsibility are two separate moments. <laughs> yeah, and we also had a follow up statement. I don't know if it's a question from uh, from an attendee that said, not sure I heard the distinction of when one is utilized versus another. I just heard that two procedures exist. So that was the follow-up. Okay, so next question. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I think Roberta kind of answered that, but I, I, I just wanted to add that if you have a, a child support um, that's established through a DOR process and there's no time sharing plan and then somebody goes in and files in front of a circuit judge a request for a time sharing plan or to establish paternity instead of time sharing plan, then um, often that judge would be able to ch change a child support since the uh, overnights will have an effect. So that might, that might happen. So it might go, kind of go back and forth. Okay. Great. Thank you, judge. So our next question uh, is, so after my final judgment, then I file child support for all three kids. And, and that one I didn't quite understand, Dane, um, when mm -hmm. it says, so after my final judgment, then I filed child support. Um, because I think in my presentation, I shared that if there is a final judgment um, for support, that that is how we enter that information into our case management system to load it and establish um, an official child support enforcement case. Okay, hopefully uh, that was helpful. Um, because yeah, that is so it, I, what I would say to the attendee who put in that question, if you can clarify, go ahead and clarify your question and hopefully Roberta's answer was helpful. Our next question is, 
Hello, what can I do if the father of my kids submits a false affidavit? So I guess I would say, I'm not sure what kind of affidavit you mean. If you mean a false financial affidavit, that's pretty darn common. Um, and I would say that you need to arm yourself with information so that you can show the court that it isn't true. For example, um, if you request that they, requ that they provide you their tax return or to pay stub, the rules say that they have to provide those to you. And then you could send that to the judge's evidence and say, judge, I'd like you to consider this evidence instead of their financial affidavit, which I think is not correct. So typically you would get, find some way through some documents or other witnesses to prove that they're not uh, being honest in their affidavit. Okay. Next question. My girlfriend has been waiting for the Department of Revenue to contact her about her case, but she has been left in the dark. Who would she need to contact to get her paperwork going? Well, awesome. I'm, I just say I wanted to respond to this, but I mean, she would contact, you know, the department. Um, I, it's unfortunate if she has contacted the, the hotline and wasn't able to get through to anybody, but no one should ever be left in the dark about status on their case. Something is, or if it isn't happening, um, a person has every right to know what's going on. And uh, Mr. Gillen provided his email address, uh, person, any uh, attendee here, they can also reach out to me. I work in the same office David does um, as a regional child support administrator for Central Florida. So if they wanna send me their contact information, I can absolutely follow up on it. I'm sure something's going on, but we will find a way to provide you that status. And uh, my email is cheri dot w-r-i-g-h-t at floridarevenue.com actually it's right there so um that's my email address like david said we don't need a whole bunch of private information um if you have your cse case number it's going to be a 10 digit all numerical um case number you can provide your court case number um it usually has two letters but we prefer the cse case number or csp case number and we can just, we'll reach out to you and, and get you some status ASAP. Yeah, and it's good that you came onto the forum tonight because uh, we're not always out there in the community and able to provide direct information like this. So uh, those of you that are attending, and I'm fine if you share it with others as well, uh, because I can, we can manage, you know, these inquiries and we want to help facilitate, you know, the sharing of information, however it happens, whether it's through a normal channel or where that comes through Sharia or I, the bottom line is we want to be able to, to serve our customers at the highest level and, and make sure that you've got the information you need to know what's going on. And if you don't have your case number, uh, your name and a phone number, as long as that's a phone, name, phone number associated with your case, we'll still be able to find you. Okay, great. Thank you. Good information. Okay, so next question that we have is a, is a little bit long one, so uh, let me read it. Hello. Thank you for putting together this presentation to educate parents regarding child support enforcement. I requested a review for an upward modification for my case due to a substantial change in income from the non-custodial parent in May 2017. Office of Child Support accepted my request on August 2017. The modification was filed with the court in December of 2017. From October 2018 through January 2020, there have been 12 failed attempts to serve the father, one successful in January of 2020. During this time, I had been in touch with two contacts in the child support office to provide updates and request information. Due to certain circumstances, my son went to live with temporary his father in November 2019, which was filed with the court. Due to COVID-19, that temporary agreement terminated and my son came back to live with me on March 13th. The unfortunate thing was that the DOR attorneys decided to voluntarily, voluntary or voluntarily dismiss my case on March 11th. So, uh, anybody want to take a stab at? Yes, I will. Uh, in general, I can speak to this. You're, you're, I would just ask that you follow up with an email to Sheree and I, and um, we can contact you and have a, a, a more detailed discussion while we're looking at everything that's available as far as what's been going on in the case. Because when there's a back and forth, 
that might have affected how that pending modification was going to be handled. I don't know. I'm just speculating. But we can certainly talk through that and get an understanding of what happened with that. As it relates to service, service is one of the most challenging things that we have to accomplish to be able to move an action forward, whether it's a new case or whether it's a modification action. And um, we have different ways of, of getting service accomplished. Um, and prior, a lot of these actions appeared to have, uh, these attempts appeared to have occurred before the pandemic started. Um, so if we have information, if we have a good address for a, 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 a residence or a place of employment or relatives, you know, we can either work through the sheriff or work through a private process server to accomplish service. Um, but people try to evade and, and um, they, they go out of their way to avoid service. And it's not that we're not trying. I mean, 12 times, that's a lot of, of effort to, to uh, complete service. So I, I'm curious as to what actually, I mean, not what actually, but what else is going on and what information do we have? Because we would have had to verify some information as far as what the reason for non-service was. And we can kind of maybe get a better idea of what our, our opportunities might be as we go forward. So what I would recommend that you do is, is follow up um, so that we can talk more about this and uh, we can answer all of your questions while we're looking at the case and then uh, make sure that you understand what the next steps are gonna be as we go forward. Yeah, and then she had a follow-up second part to her question. Her concern is if there is DOR, CSC will implement ways to improve their process on serving the non-custodial parent that are evading services. It's a huge deal, especially when this individual pays taxes in Florida, works in Florida, owns property in Florida, has a, driver's, a Florida driver's license, and a vehicle registration through the state of Florida. That was the follow-up part of her, her question. Well, David yeah. kind of covered all of, he kind of covered all of that, but it's, I mean, we make multiple, multiple attempts. And if we gain new information, I mean, that's the only way that I could see 12 attempts being made. Um, that means new information must have been provided. We take any information the other parent can provide. We will try an employer, the wherever, whatever license, whatever address is on his license. I mean, we will take all the information and make as many attempts as we can as new information comes in. Um, I'm not personally aware of any change in our service process, but uh, we don't take service lightly. It is a big deal, but it's also one of the things that is, it is out of, it is somewhat out of our control. I mean, if someone is actively trying to evade us, it does cause a lot of frustration, but having worked in customer service, what I used to tell some of our customers that come in, um, sometimes somebody can be sleeping on someone's couch. Like, you know that this, the parent lives there or that they're staying there, but if somebody is in that home willing to say, no, 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 she's not here or he's not here, we don't know that person. Um, that can effectively evade service. There are a lot of ways, unfortunately, to kind of get around service if people don't want to be forthright. But again, keep giving us information. We never, we will always welcome new ways, new addresses, new employers, new locations. Um, we do even serve the same address on occasion, again, but we really, really want new information and we will take as much new information as the other parent can provide. Yeah, that's really good information, Cherie. And the only other thing that I would add is, and I mentioned this earlier, the Department of Revenue works with a lot of partners, and the Sheriff's Department is one of those partners. And it's the Sheriff's uh, Department that is responsible for do completing most of this service um, on our cases. We do have private process servers as well. But, you know, just like we're, we work with the Sheriff, we work with, with the Judiciary, the, the clerks, the, the Department of Revenue, I think, is looked at sometimes as that we have control over all that. But well, we partner with all those partners and we, we stay, uh, we understand what's happening. And if we need to interact, because we know that on our, 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 our case management system, our CAM system, it's alerting us when service has been over 60 days and we don't have service completed and the hearing has been scheduled. So we're following up, looking for new information, and then we'll share that with our attorneys who then are responsible for getting it to the sheriff or the, or the process server to, to attempt service again. Um, but it's not an exact science. Um, but we never give up. Now, the good thing is once you filed the action, um, you may have a delay in getting, you know, after you, I'm sorry, after you filed the action, then you, you're going to be able to go back to that filing date, you know, as you start looking at, at what is the time frame as far as 
uh, was there a modification or establishment of child support? And, um, and even though you, we wanna make sure that it's happening as quickly as possible, the, the fact that it's been filed um, is kind of a, a, a line in the sand, so to speak. And Judge, Judge Tennant, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I, I don't want that to be like, well, we just want to go on forever, but it, there is um, an ability if it takes a time, some time that's not just lost time that we're not going to be able to do something about that child support that was due at that time. Okay, great. Thank you, David. So our next question is a short one. Some reason I thought only attorneys could file a motion. So no, um, pro se litigants can do basically every single thing that lawyers can do. And so um, I would encourage you to get forms down at the self-help center and um, it'll say at the top motion and then just in a couple of words, say what it is that you want. What is it that you're looking for? Motion for credit for child support or motion to contest a delinquency or motion to uh, for temporary time sharing, just short what it is and then uh, legibly uh, write in a few details of what it is you want the court to do and you file it and we get those brought to us immediately and I generally set a hearing within two or three weeks. Right. And we actually have all of the Florida Supreme Court approved um, documents in our document library in, in our self-help centers. So I do encourage you, as Judge Chen has said, to please come down to room 340. It's on the third floor um, at the Orange County Courthouse uh, for assistance if you need forms to file. Um, and, and we will make sure we will take care of you. I, I'll tell you the motions. Uh, with, with the help of our judicial officers, they're very clear. If we don't already have a motion that is a Florida Supreme Court approved form, the blank motion simply says, um, tell me exactly what you would like for me to order. And the second question, now tell me why <laughs> I should order it. So it's very clear and very precise. All right, thank you very much. So our next question. Uh, can I present text messages or, I don't know what that is, something about evidence. Is there any way to get them into evidence? Judge? So, so this is, uh, I think they're talking about like emails. And so yes, you absolutely can. So the important things to remember about evidence are generally you need to send a copy to the other side. You're going to need to send a copy to the judge, either hard paper form or uh, by email so that the judge has it during this virtual Zoom hearing you're going to have and the judge can bring it up on their screen just like we did with our PowerPoint presentations. And then you're going to have to explain to the judge why it is you know that that's emails or texts from the other person and you could say that their names at the top or that's their phone number or we were talking about our child and generally those kinds of conversations are uh, admissible. There's lots of exceptions. It's more complicated than that. But yes, I, I look at a lot of text messages in my trials. So e-evidence is admissible? Yes. Okay. If the, if, all, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Roberta. I think what's also extremely important is they need to ask the court the question. <laughs> Would you enter this into evidence yeah. and then explain why? Um, because it's not automatic just because you emailed the judge and you get in there and yeah. argue with the judge. I emailed you. So this is a fabulous point. This is a great point. Emailing the judge, great point. Emailing the judge isn't enough. Filing it isn't enough. Attaching it to your motion isn't enough. You actually have to say, judge, I want you to use this as evidence at the hearing. Judge, I filed something I want you to use as evidence. Judge, I sent you something I want you to use as evidence. That's a great point. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Great, great information. Okay, so if you still have a question out there, you're chopping at the bit, get it in to us because we're getting towards the, some of our final questions. Q&A function and submit it. Our next question. My girlfriend's ex-husband lives in South Carolina. Does it take longer to process child support paperwork with the Department of Revenue? Her child is 11 going on 12 this November. She desperately needs the child support, but the ex-husband is on his own plan and ghosts her girlfriend or my girlfriend. Well, we definitely process cases, interstate uh, cases. Um, so uh, not knowing what exactly it means by the ex-husband is on his own plan. I'm not sure what that means. If there's a court order 
in South Carolina or here, uh, if it's here, we could register it in South Carolina. If it's there, we could we can ask them to enforce it. So what I'd add, if you if you don't have a if you've not contacted the Department of Revenue, um, you know I would go out to that website that I've been um, talking about, uh, FloridaRevenue.com backslash child support, and you can get the information about interstate case processing, and you can also apply for services um, at that. Um, on through a link on that uh, web page as well. You can also send me an, uh, an email and I'd be happy to in interact a little bit with you to, to give you some further guidance if you would, would like that. But the bottom line is, yes, absolutely. We have thousands and thousands of interstate cases, uh, not just in the United States, but internationally. Um, we have reciprocity with, I think, 30 different countries. Yes, it could take a little bit longer depending on what's going on. Obviously during a pandemic, uh, anything new processing to another case, uh, state is going to take some time, but um, we will definitely uh, continue to we'll do that and we will process it and manage it based on the current circumstances. And um, that's better than not doing anything because eventually this will pass and things will start to normalize and um, and we'll make sure that we'll we'll put you in a position where there's a good chance that child support will be paid. Okay, thank you, David. So our next question, our attendee is saying, I'm pro se, my case is in Orange County. I request a subpoena to non-party in my paternity. They don't want to collaborate. What can I do? What I'm assuming you mean is you're, you're, you've sent a third party subpoena to a bank or a business or something to get records and they're not uh, they're not cooperating, not responding. Um, it, it's hard for me to know exactly how you did the subpoena, but generally I would say you could write a motion to the judge that says, I did a, th a third party subpoena and they did not respond. Would you please issue an order telling them that they must respond? And then if they, if they ignore that court order, you can do a motion for contempt and we can bring them in and threaten them with jail for not having provided the document. So that would be the first step is I'd write a motion and say, judge, please give me a court order telling them they have to do it. Okay, very good. So we're down to uh, one or two questions here. So our next question is, I once had a DOR case and I'm owed thousands. My child is an adult now. If my ex filed his taxes, would I have received his stimulus? Does the enforcement remain in the system on some level? That's a great question. Yeah, well, and, and when you say does the enforcement, if you have not um, received a notice terminating <laughs> um, enforcement, then enforcement is still in place. When Department of Revenue comes out of a case, they will file a notice with my office that says that they are terminating their services. And so they're no longer uh, providing 4D services for that particular case. If the child has emancipated um, and they're thousands old, that rolls over into, and when I spoke about the terms, it rolls over into automatic arrears. And that is the way the statute reads. It, it, it's no longer ongoing support because the child has emancipated uh, per se, um, but now that's arrears that's still old. And the way the rule reads is uh, the obligor is still on the hook to pay those arrears at the same level as the ongoing support was being paid out. Um, if that is not happening, I mean, if there was money on the books and, and you're old, I will tell you, um, I can't speak in general across the board, but yes, you probably should have. Um, in terms of the taxes and, and, and the stimulus, um, my office has received thousands and we're continuing to receive thousands of intercepts. And that's what we call those uh, intercepts uh, by way of the IRS for us to process into um, existing child support cases. So, so, Dave, so David and Sharid, is it treated differently though? If a child is no longer a minor, will you still, will the department still go grab those monies um, just based on an arrearage if there's no ongoing? 
I was just curious. Yes, yes. Roberta kind of explained what happens as far as how that final um, obligation amount is determined once the child emancipates as far as that, uh, that ongoing support. So the current support obligation is added to the uh, whatever arrears repayment, which allows for a quicker repayment. But the question um, on this one, I, if, if the case is open, and you're going to want to check with us to make sure your case is open, because if it's right. open and the, the arrears right. are over $500, it'll automatically be certified to the IRS for offset and just like the clerk's office did, like Roberta was explaining, the Department of Revenue has, I mean, we've received an enormous amount of, of stimulus money to apply towards uh, child support cases. And um, so if, if there was a filing, then yeah, it, it, and there, there was an open case, um, then that would have been processed. So um, you're gonna wanna check with us, find out, see what's going on with the case because the arrears will never go away. No matter how, how old your child gets, the arrear, we will continue to uh, try to get repayment on those arrears. Um, so not, no time frame is going to stop us from continuing to try to do that. So um, that, that's the, the short answer. I can, we can interact more if you want to reach out to me and, and try to get an understanding of what's going on um, right now with your case. And we do and enforce arrears only orders, but actually, Roberta, I didn't know that the clerk will intercept and then it's we're not intercepting. We receive those intercepts uh, from the SDU. Right. From where we've intercepted. Yes, from where you've Okay, okay, yes. yes. So it's that, that's our nice little triangle, Department of <laughs> Revenue, SDU, clerk. <laughs> and so we all kind of work together to process them. And, and I can tell you, my clerks have been working nonstop. I've had to put additional personnel on um, the number of intercepts that are coming down for us to uh, impute them into the case management system. And I'm glad you guys had that back and forth because I did want to say one other thing about the, uh, the treasury offsets. The Department of Revenue is the only agency that has the authority to do right. the treasury offsets. That also mm -hmm. includes unemployment comp offsets. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but some people do and they, they they open a case just because they know there's going to be that opportunity to get some additional money directly from those types of, of collections. And, and David, um, just, I don't want to hasten because I saw a question earlier and somebody talked about money going out of the country and how do I freeze an account? And the clerk's office and, 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 and the SDU, we don't do um, bank liens either. So we don't place liens on bank accounts. The Department of Revenue is the only entity that has the um, ability to place a lien on someone's bank account as yeah, well. Absolutely. Shuri, you want to talk a little bit about uh, financial institution data matches? Um, we have our, we, basically we interface with our financial institutions. Um, they report to us once a case, a case's enforcement has progressed to that level because it isn't something that we start off with. You don't just miss one or two payments and like people think you miss, oh, I've missed two payments, I'm gonna get my license suspended. I mean, we have steps in place. All of our enforcement is basically automated and it's month, it's 30 to 60 days for almost every enforcement to even occur. Once it has gotten to that step, um, it does send out and if fit a match um, to try and see if this parent has a bank account that they are a primary um, person on that bank account. And we basically place a freeze on it. And so we don't say anything to anyone, but we can, can continue to collect funds anywhere from 30 to 60 days. And then after that, we do notify the parent, hey, we've put in a freeze or a lien on your bank account. You can do nothing. You can agree to it and release the funds to us. You can contest it. Um, there are always options to whenever we take an enforcement action, but that was also what I spoke to earlier. You know, people have bank accounts with their new partners, and we will allow a, a parent, a parent owing support, new spouse, to get that money out of it. Obviously, we're going to leave the other parent's paycheck, proof that their paycheck was deposited into this account, and we can get that to them. Not none of this is instantly, but it is handled pretty quickly because we don't want to adversely affect the other, your spouse that has absolutely nothing to do with your child support case. So we can, we have ways to remedy it in case 
people get caught up in it erroneously, but it is one of our enforcement tools. It is effective. Um, it's not our most popular, but it does get it done. And as far as uh, foreign bank accounts, we're only kind of, to my knowledge, we're only going to be looking here within the U.S., but it is within the U.S. It's not just in the state. It's we. It's wherever the bank is at, we, we will put the freeze on it. Uh, Dane, really quickly, um, I don't know if people realize we have three full-time hearing officers uh, within the Ninth Judicial Circuit that handles all of the proceedings um, for our 4D child support cases. And one of our hearing officers, actually the administrative hearing officer, did comment um, right after my presentation when we start talking about emancipation. And I said, file a motion. She is absolutely correct. It is not a motion if um, the information was not in the final judgment. And I think I said everything, when we build a case into the uh, child support case management system, we build it directly from the final judgment um, establishing child support. If you did not include the language about that, it is not an automatic. You may have to file a modification to get the order changed um, to extend it through um, until that child graduates. And so I just wanted to clarify because I promised her I would. So, so, so to, to follow up on that, so that's true. And sometimes it's hard to know whether you need a motion or whether you need a supplemental petition. Right. Generally, if you file a motion and that's wrong, generally the judge is going to, or, or whoever's a judge or the hearing officer is going to say, you know, dismiss because this requires a supplemental petition. And then it's, it's a, it's, it seems like a small difference, but it's a pretty big difference legally. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for all that. We're down to our final question that was sent in by email. And so it is about modifications again, during this COVID-19 environment we're in. And the question is why can't I get a modification? I no longer make the same amount of pay but I've been denied several times. What can we share with people who've been through that scenario? So I, so I guess I would share a couple of things. One is, and I think, I forget, somebody mentioned this earlier, it might've been Roberta. It, it, uh, it is possible to get a temporary abatement or stop or something relief on child support. Generally, modifications are geared toward permanent, long-term, permanent, changes. Mm -hmm. I think that across the board, at least as far as the judges are concerned, um, we all hope that this COVID thing is going to be a short-term problem and that people will get back up on their feet. And we don't want to go in and move child support only to have to go do another modification down the road. And so the thing to keep in mind is if you have a modification pending, the court cannot go forward with a contempt without doing them together. And at least you're putting the court on notice that there are problems in the event that somebody files a contempt motion. Um, but generally, you need to have a longer term problem than, than we're at right now. But um, I, I can understand why it's frustrating a lot of people on both sides. Anybody will have a better DOR answer to that question? <laughs> uh, the, only, the, only, uh, it, the only guidance I could provide the questioner is to reach out to me. Um, because we'd want to look to see exactly what's going on. What are the circumstances? Just like with, with anything. And if there's something that we can do, we certainly will try to do it. Um, but without having the details, it's hard to really respond any differently than Judge Tennis did. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it, you, you need more than I lost my job. It's your obligation. If you have a financial obligation to support your children, it's your job to go out there and find something to supplant it. And there's a lot of industries that are doing really great. Publix, Uber Eats, I mean, it's your job to go out there and do the best you can and pay whatever you can. And if you're finding, figuring out a way to pay other bills somehow, the judge is gonna to wanna to know why it is this, is this obligation isn't getting paid. So you really gotta prove, not just that you lost the job, but that you're really doing what you can to pay as much as possible and go out and find alternative employment. So that's the expectation. Yeah, and just one other quick piece of information. We have very, very close relationships with the um, workforce development. And, uh, and so we have, if you contact us and you have lost your job and you're not getting any of the PPE money or the unemployment, 
um, there are employers that are hiring, just like Judge Tennis said, and um, we can certainly share that information that we have or put you in contact with somebody that might be able to help you um, with your employment searches. Hey. And All I right. would say a lot in large part when people come into the self-help center asking about modification or coming to room 315, which is my child support office, um, in large part, they're saying, well, the child used to live with, with parent A and now the child <laughs> lives with parent B. How can I modify my child support? Well, if you two have come up with an agreement that, that you're going to have a change in circumstance like that, I would recommend that you put something in writing and attach it to anything that you're going to file to show that the two of you are jointly um, sharing this with the court and asking the court together to make a change. Great. All right. If we don't have any other further comments or uh, uh, further information for our folks, before everybody goes, please know this. We have a survey. We ask you to please take our survey uh, once the webinar ends. That way it gives us great feedback on, was this helpful? Was this good information? Was there something missing? Something more you'd like to see? Uh, topics for the future? Uh, so please take our survey. So I uh, want to thank all of our panelists, of course, Judge Diana Tennis. We had David Gillen and Cherie Wright from EOR, Department of Revenue, and our Roberta Walton, who's here with our self-help center and our manager of our family division. So the Orange County Clerk of Courts clerk, Tiffany Moore Russell, understands the importance of these conversations in the community, and that's why we hold these. We hope you find these informative, educational, um, as a service to you in the community. We hope the topics discussed are helpful. So let us know in that survey, uh, even other topics you'd like to see. And once posted, you may actually view this webinar um, online. It'll be on our website, myorangeclerk.com. It'll also be on social media platforms for the clerk's office. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. So look for those and connect with us there for, to get updates. That we post a lot of information there as well about upcoming forums and outreach that we're doing with the community. So again, thank you for joining us. And once again, take that survey on the screen, if you could fill that out and we appreciate it. So thank you everybody. Thank you for taking time. Have a great evening.